Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 15, titled Duty and Honor, or also known as The Savage. I don't know why they changed the name, and everywhere I read, no one knows why they changed the name. So, but it was originally titled The Savage, but then it decided before publishing that they changed the name to Duty and Honor. Interesting. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. know. <laughs> how, those, how those have to do with each other. <laughs> it originally premiered on February 6, 1987. It is written by Martin Kupfer, who also wrote Bought and Paid For and Kill Shot. So, two good episodes. Favorites of ours. Yes. Yeah. Very strong episodes, mm-hmm. especially High Ally. Mm-hmm. No one can forget High Ally. <laughs> <laughs> and it is directed by John Nicolella. If, in case you forgot, John Nicolella also directed Milk Run, Lombard, Whatever Works, Bought and Paid For, Fill the Shill, and a whole host of other episodes. And he was also the co-producer for Miami Vice for seasons one and two. So he is back. This is the last episode he will direct to. So really bring in the game with this one. They brought the heat for this one and it, it paid off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unlike last week, Cuba <laughs> Libre. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, can check in and see what's going to each other's lives. Guys, a Don Johnson movie hit the theaters this Friday. And I haven't seen it yet. How? What kind of crap is that? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's, it's starring Vince Vaughn. Uh, it's kind of a you know not not a mainstream movie it's it's got a decent budget it's like okay this is interesting we talked a little bit about it a few episodes ago surprise it has a 97 percent rating on rotten tomatoes and almost eight out of ten on imdb and a three and a half out of four on RogerEber.com. this movie is performing really well and and i think we can easily say it's not because of vince vaughn uh-uh. it's not because of the director that's nope. on no it's because Don Johnson is co-starring in it. Of course. He's, he's the only reason people are seeing this. So, so those ratings are far and above the ratings of Transformers The Last Night. <laughs> well, which I yeah. watched the other night, uh, which is terrible. Um, so terrible. I, terrible. I, I, I think we can pretty much establish it at this point. Don Johnson greater than Marky Mark. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... Hey, I've actually paid my own personal money to see the last night in theaters. Yeah, but you went to the theater and there was only $2 at least. <laughs> True. You went to the $2 Who, whoever's theater. Writing, whoever's writing the jokes for that franchise needs to be fired. It, <laughs> it's just not jokes? like every every time they did that a joke, it was just kind of sad. <laughs> no one laughed. <laughs> They're trying, John. I mean, you didn't think the old timey steampunk robot butler wasn't a funny guy oh <laughs> we don't have enough time to get into this so let's get into the, <laughs> the episode speaking of things that aren't funny this is a very serious episode from miami vice and you know what a really really good episode too so let's go talk about this one because we start off so strong i cannot wait to talk about how we open in this <laughs> let's go talk about this episode Okay, so I've I've waited. We watched this earlier in the week. We opened this episode in Saigon, 1972. I cannot wait to talk about this. It's night on the town for the GIs. They're out p- picking up hookers. Yeah, up pulls a jeep, and someone gets out, and they have a ponytail. And it's like, holy crap, that is Castillo <laughs> with a ponytail and no mustache. <laughs> it is a sweet ponytail, too. I mean, like, <laughs> he looks total badass. Old school action hero ponytail. <laughs> well, mostly you got a point too. That it means he must have had to shave his mustache off. So does that mean that Marty wears a prosthetic mustache? <laughs> oh my god! It's not his real mustache. <laughs> no, I've seen James Earl Jones's mustache. Now it's got to be Edward James Olmos. Olmos. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that was a complete mix up. He's got the look on your face when I said it. I'm like, what? <laughs> I've seen his mustache now. It's definitely real. <laughs> I don't know how that works. And how did he shave it off and then shave it, grow it back on? And is all he that? like a chia pet? Like they just <laughs> squeeze it, water him for a couple of days. Yeah, squeeze them. Popped out like a. I, uh, I think this means that they had to record. They must have filmed this scene after they filmed the episode. It is interesting that he replaced the ponytail with a mustache later on, like some kind of sign of maturity. You know. <laughs> 
cut off your ponytail and you grow a thick mustache. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, of course, it's Saigon. It's the 70s. He's in the CIA. So what do you do? You stop off at the whorehouse. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Turns out, though, he is there on work and he gets there's uh, Saigon police all over the place. He walks into a room and there's a dead prostitute on the ground and then smeared on the wall in blood is vc whore and then a friend of hers is there and she's crying she's telling marty she's not Viet Cong. this is the sixth murder that they found to all of them have been prostitutes the police are pressing on castillo too they want answers on why the cia and more of the 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 department is you know, working harder to try and solve who this killer is because it kind of sound makes it out to sound like they suspect that it's someone that's it's an American. Yeah, that's the only reason why they bring the CIA into it, right? I mean, otherwise they'd handle it within their own entities. They wouldn't bring in the CIA. Yeah, I don't think the CIA is used very often for investigating the dead hookers. But it is <laughs> nice to see that Castillo did have some vice experience before getting the job as lieutenant. Yeah. Uh, he, he has experience with dead hookers. He's had a lot of experience, apparently. <laughs> Castillo was in there and he's talking to a specific a captain or a lieutenant for the Saigon police. That's important. That's going to come back around at the end of this episode. When we fast forward to today, they're at another crime scene, another dead hooker, and VC whore is smeared on the wall. No witnesses. Gina's out searching. And then an officer comes in and says he'll have the coroner's report on his desk by the morning. But, of course, Castillo has seen all this before. He knows exactly what happened to her. Says check for K bar wounds. There's not going to be any sign of sexual assault. Like he knows exactly what happened. And the look on the coroner's face, you know, he's got this look like, stop telling me how to do my job. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're going to be on, a, on Crockett's boat. But we do want to stop right here because there's a big guest star in this episode of Miami Vice. Now, you would think, oh, I'm going to say Helena Bonham Carter. But she's going to be in next week's episode, but she is definitely second fiddle to the main guest star that we're talking about here. He plays Inspector Nguyen Van Tran. We can talk more about Helena Bonham Carter next week. I want to talk about Haiyang S. Nagore, who is a Cambodian-American gynecologist and obstetrician actor author and refugee he won an academy award for supporting actor for his role in 1984's the killing fields uh which interesting enough the killing fields is about the cambodian genocide that he actually lived through he was a refugee from it and actually spent for survived three terms in cambodian prison camps mostly surviving by eating beetles termites and scorpions one thing i read which is a if we were to stop right here, he's amazing. He survived these three prison camps. He lived through one of the worst genocides in the history of the earth. It, he survived one of the worst genocides, and he also won an Academy Award. He's one of two people ever to win an Academy Award without basically not being an actor previously. But it goes on from there. One thing that was crazy to me and I, uh, is that his his wife, and this just must have been so hard for him, during his wife was in the refugee camps with him, and she actually died during childbirth while they were imprisoned. It must have been hard for him being an obstetrician, you know, knowing that it, he could save her. He escapes, basically crawl, crawls his way into a, a Red Cross camp across the Vietnamese border, comes to America, and he does the movie The Killing Fields. He continues acting and writes, writes a book about his experiences in Cambodia. And then in 1996, tragically, he was shot outside of his home in, in Chinatown, downtown L.A., by three members of the, quote, Oriental Lazy Boys street gang. It's been claimed that he, he was shot during a robbery gone wrong when he wouldn't give up a locket with a picture of his wife in it. Some people argue and say that it was a political killing that because he actually had almost $3,000 on him when they found him that the muggers didn't take. All three guys were found in 1998, coincidentally on the same day that Pol Pot's death was announced. Kind of a crazy bio for going through. This man is amazing. He was first a doctor and then he was held in prison camps in Cambodia. 
He escaped, came to America, co-starred in a movie about the genocide in his first role ever and won an Academy Award. One of only two people to ever win the Academy Award is non-professional actors. And one of the very few Asian people who have ever won an Academy Award. They wrote a book. And then to have it all come down to, he may have been murdered in a robbery gone wrong. I know. What a waste. That was an amazing person over uh, over a locket. That- <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's such a big get for Miami Vice, too. Because this episode aired after he won his Academy Award. So I know we talked about big guest stars before in the history of Miami Vice, but I don't, I don't know how many we have that are Academy Award winning actors. Oh, no, not many. That's for sure. Such a monumental history. Uh, just everything he survived and everything he accomplished after the fact it definitely beats the pants off of a lot of the people we've seen thus far. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we stopped and talked about this man before we moved on and and gave him his own due because like i was saying this is such a big get for my device he is such an amazing person he has an amazing story and then it's it's just amazing he's in this episode yeah (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. even though he did continue acting he was very selective uh with his roles it seemed you know when i looked at the stuff that he was in we're gonna see a lot of him throughout this episode and he is a key part of it so let's move on and get to that very important part near the end of the episode we learn uh, when we learn who he actually is when we do come back from the opening credits we have a fast scene where croc is running out on his new girlfriend Teresa. duty calls he's gotta go to work we're gonna come back to Teresa because next week's episode is literally titled Teresa. So I think it's going to be a lot more information about her. (laughs) Because I got the feeling that she is like his therapist or something. She's a doctor. Of course, Crockett's banging his therapist. Yeah, no, Um. she's actually an ER doctor. Ah. Just for the future reference, Ah. she's an ER doctor. (laughs) Pay attention. Okay. Pay attention. That's an important thing. I I was distracted because he makes this comment about they're kind of half flirting about as he's trying to get ready to go to work. And he makes this thing, I guess it's my Pavlovian response. And I spent most of the scene trying to figure out like, was that like a, what did he mean by that? (laughs) (laughs) He's a dog. That's what he meant by that. (laughs) He just drools. When Crockett makes it. He do nice things to dogs though. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know. know. When Crockett makes it out of the precinct, there's a full team response. Also, Crockett's hair is hit that peak big mullet. Oh, it gets better. (laughs) So much better. (laughs) The team is having a hard time believing that the person from Saigon is the same person that's here, including Trudy. Trudy throughout this whole episode is very exasperated. It's like every time they mention this, there's a similarity. She's like... Because it's a lot of hey, she has to do a lot of work. Okay, she does all the work. Like crap, now I'm gonna have to go get records from Saigon. Where am I gonna get those from? I got the feeling that Crockett was almost annoyed that they were like interrupting his sexy time. You know, he was very animated, kind of pacing back and forth. He doesn't get very much sex. Okay. He's neglected. <laughs> so I take the, the does... flight attendants are on to him at this yeah. point. <laughs> None of them will date him. Yeah, exactly. So I tech does pop in and say Castillo is right. The murder weapon was a K bar. So the next morning, Castillo's out at this site and he's meeting with a man who represents Sen- Senor Espinosa. And they're telling the Miami PD, like, this is where we are going to have our speech. This is where we want things to be protected. The head of security is there. He's saying all of these things. They step off t- to the side, and Castillo talks to the police captain. He says he wants his people taken off of the Espinosa assignment, and he wants them to be dedicated just on the hooker killings. And the captain's like, eh, all right, cool. Yeah, we don't need <laughs> <Whatever>. you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> down at the va hospital that's where the duo are hanging out and they're over there talking to dr morris and dr morris is very clearly saying i will not let you talk to any of my people without a court order now get out and don't let the door hit you in the ass <laughs> a doctor protecting their yeah. patients crazy <laughs> this scene is pretty much comes down to doctor patient confidentiality and Tubbs and crockett having to get banged over the head to understand this concept <laughs> <laughs> well, Crockett kind of says he's like, he calls Castillo because he's like, I'll get you the court order. And Crockett's like, I feel bad about doing this. And Tubbs is like, I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about these vets. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's like, whatever. I get the court order. Let's talk to him. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got a job to do. <laughs> 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 they do a head out. They go then talk to a cabbie who called about a tip that they saw a man inside of the abandoned building, I think, where the hooker was found in modern day, not the Saigon hooker, obviously. <laughs> He's traveled <laughs> far. <laughs> the duo walks into the building and they find a man in there, Nguyen Van Tran from the Singapore. They don't they, they the don't S- walk into the building. They, they they go in there guns blonde because they take that police tape seriously in Miami. <laughs> well, Tran, you will recognize from the opening that he was from the Saigon police. So now things are getting really interesting. The duo start saying they're going to arrest him. He's like, I just want to talk to your boss. Yeah, I'm starting back- to feel like I've seen this movie before. <laughs> <laughs> back at the precinct Swai Tech is telling Castillo that they arrested Tran and Castillo immediately knows who he is so we just have this confirmation Like, yeah they know each other it's, it's who he's supposed to be it's okay mm-hmm. <laughs> we get this scene where their Crockett and Tubbs are interrogating him Castillo shows up in the dark hey buddy hey pal you know long time <laughs> yeah. no see yeah I know it's like, you don't okay. ride a call anymore <laughs> you know they hold hands for a few minutes I mean how how well did they really know each other back then they didn't act like they knew each other that well <laughs> key point they act like they really know each other really well now don't though also, he didn't age any. Can we talk about that? <laughs> yeah, neither of them yeah. aged. Well, I mean, the, the mustache yeah. well, and ponytail aged, but, not, <laughs> but not yeah, that's Tran. what I was gonna say. Like, how does Tran not make comment? Like, hey, man, where's the ponytail? What's <laughs> this? What's him. this crap on your face? <laughs> that's not him. The man I knew had a had no mustache and a ponytail. <laughs> And he wore Speedos. <laughs> <laughs> then they decide to turn this meeting into a real meeting and head out of the interrogation room and over to the regular meeting room. And this is when Castillo says that they found six murders in nine days in Saigon. Tran also says that they found more murders in Thailand. Same thing over nine days. So now full court press. This is clearly the same person. Tran showed up because he recognizes the same person too. And this always happens in a very small window of just nine days so 12 hour shifts don't uh, underestimate him all hands on deck and crockett makes a uh, very brilliant deduction this is probably not his first rodeo he didn't just stop after oh what nine years or whatever that's when uh, i think they put trudy on it where she's she goes they go hunting for the murders that they don't know about. Yeah, she's got to call like every police department around the entire globe and find out if there's been a connection between these murders where there was these prostitutes being killed in a narrow window like this. Okay, but how did Tran mm-hmm. hear about it? How did he know about the killing? Good question. I mean, I have to know. Like, he's supposed to be, he was living far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do they report it on their local news that something happened in Miami? <laughs> Florida, the United States, I don't get it. So we jump to this hotel, and there's a man just staring in the mirror, and he's got this giant knife, and he's like, is he putting it in like a sword sheath over his shoulder or something? He's very angry and insane looking. As he does this. <laughs> <laughs> and awkward. And and he confirms that by going downstairs. He turns in his keys to the front desk and then grabs and assaults the woman behind the counter. Tells her she watches too much TV. Well, she does watch a lot of TV, though. <laughs> <laughs> that lady, by the way, is Judy. Melina, uh, she played the grandmother in the movie The Adams Family, but she was also in some other pretty big movies, Dog Day Afternoon, uh, China Girl, to name a few. What I find interesting about her is her first husband, Julian Beck, her and Beck, founded a group called The Living Theater in 1947. Believe it or not, it's still open today. Wow. Uh, it almost closed in 1963 due to tax issues, and Beck and Melina actually left the country in 68 to avoid it. Uh, eventually they got it worked out they returned back to the states and split the group up into three parts part of the group moved to India to follow the Bollywood scene the other another part of the group moved to London for uh, some stage scene or something they had there and they went with a part of the group to Brazil where they basically just up and moved to and they had a rather unconventional conventional marriage. Beck had a male partner that he used to trot around with, and Melina had several 
men that she would <laughs> you get so, them. yeah you get them yeah <laughs> Beck died in 1985 from cancer and she would eventually marry one of the group members, Hanan Reskinov. There's a lot more to that story to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> there is. There is. So I, I, I just love that her husband had a boyfriend and she had multiple boyfriends. It's like, like fine. You want to have Melina? one? <laughs> you want to have, have one? two. Yeah. <laughs> Back at the VA, the duo are accosting more war wounded warriors. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor is not happy, but they start doing the interview. And this is where we get our Miami Vice montage of the man that we saw that was looking at himself in the mirror. He's out doing it, doing interviews for hookers. And the duo are doing interviews with wounded soldiers. Interviews. <laughs> that's, a, that's one way to put it. <laughs> uh, the one thing I was curious about this episode is like at no point did they ever warn the hookers that, you know, <laughs> there's a serial murderer <laughs> walking the streets. I thought that too. Crockett has a good it's relationship like, with them too. Yeah. I mean, like if this was criminal yeah. minds, they'd be out there on the street telling them like, hey, you know, uh, you might want to stay in for the next couple of days. It's only nine days. Like, stay in for those these next nine days. <laughs> Just saying. Eventually, the man settles on a hooker. We find we had found out earlier that he's seen the women with black hair, so he gets himself a black haired woman. And the montage ends with him murdering her and smearing her blood on the wall. Now stop. <laughs> if pretty sure fingerprints has been around for for a time i'm pretty sure when you join like a government agency they fingerprint you yes <laughs> something tells me there's a way to connect the dots at this case a lot quicker than they do yeah but there's also the key to that right is that we can't give away too much right but the, the key is that they already know <laughs> uh, <laughs> right and they keep getting away with it for a reason <laughs> all right back to hooker slaying <laughs> Nice segue, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, the duo take off from the VA and head over to the murder scene. And when they get there, Castile's like, you guys should work harder. I'm showing off in front of my friend, Tran. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, boy, do are they, boy, do they become friends throughout this episode. I'm going to talk about that a little later. Palling around. <laughs> <laughs> at the precinct and we mentioned this before trudy is amazing trudy has found evidence all over the world to pin on a serial killer and no department ever came up with a single lead but trudy was able to put all of them together <laughs> yes yeah, he's been murdering pop. his way across asia for nine years and no one's ever put it together <laughs> took trudy like two days <laughs> hours like six hours she's got it already and th she's using like a typewriter it's not even a computer she's using a phone and a typewriter uh -huh. typing it up she even stopped half through the, so that she could look up to see what a k-bar was <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> she's even more amazing than this too because castillo and tran look through the papers they tie the dates to of one of the prostitution murder stretches to an assassination that was done by the cia so the killer might be an assassin. So then Castillo turns to Trudy and is like, talk to the State Department and find out about assassinations around the dates of the last murders in each country. She's like, are you kidding me? I was just on the phone with these countries. <laughs> Weren't you in the CIA? Don't you have connections that you could call? Which he does. That's and he uses this later. Yeah. So he just wanted to make Trudy do all this legwork for nothing. But all it would take is one phone call and you'd be like, oh, okay, now I know the information. Uh, not necessarily. We find out when we meet his CIA connection, he, they're not on the best of terms. Well, true, because that guy's a jerk off. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also not working for the CIA anymore either. Yeah. Like he's out too. Just real fast oh. at the VA, there's the, the duo are questioning the vets even more. It's going horribly. We go back to the precinct, and Trudy has found the link from Interpol <laughs> that there's an assassination <laughs> happened for all of them except for one in Brussels. Jesus Christ, Trudy. <laughs> I feel Copenhagen. like they should have just waited at the station, right? Like, waited for her to do her job. And then, <laughs> like, don't go back and harass these poor veterans that have nothing to do with it. Hang out, uh -huh. have some coffee. She'll figure it out. Like, give her give her a couple hours. She'll so, so pretty much, yeah, pretty much he's assassinated people in every spot. And then he vacationed in Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't kill in Copenhagen. They're all blondes. <laughs> There's no dark-haired women. <laughs> Tran says, 
I'm going to come back with answers and like heads down to the basement. I thought he was leaving, <laughs> like he was going somewhere, but he just goes down to like the basement into the archives and he starts looking through old papers. Like, well, how does he know they're down there? <laughs> I don't know. What is going on? Spe- speaking of another amazing person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's found evidence that an attache died in his sleep in Copenhagen. And so now they have a link. So I said Brussels, but you're, you're right, John. It's Copenhagen. So now they have links to all of them having assassinations. There was just one that wasn't actually listed as an assassination. Yeah, because they didn't know it was a, it was a secret death. <laughs> and this is no? something <laughs> that, was, that we find out later with Savage, who's the who's our bad guy here and we find out later is that he killed so many people when he was working for the cia and they were fighting against the Viet Cong. he killed a lot of them in their sleep that's kind of his specialty that's his like calling card mm-hmm. other than the horror writing on the- <laughs> 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 and there's that but- so, <laughs> so now we jump to the streets duo <laughs> the street. have given up harassing <laughs> have given up harassing veterans <laughs> and when, I'm watching this scene, and they're hanging out with the hookers, and they're trying, and Crockett just starts zeroing in on the savage who's going around, like, trying to pick up a prostitute, just starts zeroing in. And my first thought was, man, he's an astute investigator. <laughs> then my second thought was, or he's just a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, because he was the only guy that was a minority. He and, zeroed in on him right away. I, mean, I guess he'd be suspicious in not many people pick up hookers by foot. <laughs> True. I mean, wait a minute. <laughs> yes. You want to walk back to the bus with me and then go to my room? You want to come meet me behind these dumpsters? <laughs> yeah, I know. Come on, baby. Hop on handlebars. <laughs> He does zero in on him real fast, has instant suspicion, and then goes up like, hey, Judy, I think that's the murderer. Go, Hey, Gina, I think that's the murderer. Go talk to him. I don't understand what he expected to get out of that, though. <laughs> like, just sending Gina in harm's way. Also, yeah, also, he gives her a phrase yeah. in Vietnamese <laughs> to tell him, and Gina has no idea what it means. And it's like some kind of thing that Crockett knows is going to set him off. Say this, because it'll piss him off. <laughs> also... Also, the wigs that the ladies are wearing <laughs> are amazing. Hey, you like the girls with black hair. You have to get the stupidest black haired wig you can they, find. They must have got them at the Spirit Halloween store. <laughs> I mean, it's the season. Tis the season. Yeah. They went and got the blackest, longest wigs that they could. I mean, it's, it's comical. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's in the wig with uh, black hair. Okay. Give me the blackest wig that goes it's out like, of my knees. <laughs> it's like the cousin it wig, right? Like. <laughs> So Gina goes over there and tells him what Crockett told her to say. <laughs> Not he... right, though. They shouldn't pronounce it correctly, I don't think. <laughs> and, of course, Savage, like, flips out. And she immediately says, hey, pal, Miami Vice. And then he runs off and Crockett gives chase. And we have the, a chase montage. And Crockett is really struggling. And the assassin's like, dude, my favorite part of this chase montage is that he eventually it turns, he Crockett runs and hops in the Ferrari and starts chasing the uh, Savage's car. And about halfway through the car chase, like a box or something falls in front of the Ferrari. <laughs> And Crockett has to stop and move it out of the way and then get back in the Ferrari <laughs> and continue the chase. Like he stops mid chase to avoid scratching his car. <laughs> yeah, I can't scratch this car. Can you drive around he it? He doesn't or technically own it. True. So. True story. Shit. <laughs> he's technically, leasing he's leasing. It. So. Yeah. <laughs> but he does get in his car at like the slowest pace, too. He's like very, qu- very nicely closes the door <laughs> and then lets him to- uh-huh. the chase now. <laughs> Eventually, when he catches up, the car is lit on fire and Savage is gone. But now they've seen him at the precinct. The next morning, the team is reviewing the police sketch to give it to Espinosa, security manager. Espinosa, yes, a, a police cancel. sketch that looks absolutely nothing like the Savage. <laughs> that is horrible. I don't know how they think this looks like him. <laughs> hey, it works pretty good. Everyone else they show it to recognizes him right away too. Yeah, I know him. <laughs> so now we go back to the VA hospital, and they finally have something. Luckily, at the Miami VA hospital, there's a member of every branch of government that has been involved with every type of operation. Luckily, because they talked to a man who was part of the CIA pacification program known as Operation Phoenix. And this man, although he's in a lot of pain, he's willing to talk about the man they called Savage, who was the best killer on their team. He killed over 40 VC behind enemy lines. He last saw him in 1970. So this is when I said 
he's known for killing people in their sleep. This is when we find that out. Yep. Just don't laugh at his little wiener. Because <laughs> <laughs> the this man also tells a story about Savage that saying that he was attacked by a hooker in Nam who essentially cut his dick off. Essentially. That, I think that's what this comes down to, that because he then went and recovered in Japan and then went back to Nam. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically he was mutilated and ne- he was never the same after that. So, and that's why he kills hookers. Well, I mean, he would kind of have a <laughs> <laughs> kind of have a personal vendetta. I, mean, yeah, I guess he, he does have kind of a gripe. <laughs> he holds a grudge. I mean, he could get over it already. You know? <laughs> so that night at the docks, Castillo takes Tran and they go meet someone named Felix Larson. He's ex CIA. Larson is a little intense. <laughs> Even for Castillo. <laughs> <laughs> More intense yeah, than Castillo could... <laughs> that can't be, you know? Well, Castillo's like, you know, how's the CIA treating you? His contact's like, F you, Marty. <laughs> like, I can't believe you're calling in this card. I can't believe I'm even talking to you. You're a disgrace. <laughs> At the hotel, the woman behind the counter sees on TV the man, the police sketch. That looks nothing like the... <laughs> of the man that assaulted her. And then he walks in. So she turns the TV off. She plays it cool, gets him his keys. He goes up to his room. At the precinct, Castillo and Tran are just kind of hanging out. Like, Tran's like laying on the sofa. They're just kind of chilling. Dude, and this is what I wanted to get to. So Lieutenant Castillo says, we're not getting anywhere right now. Why don't you go back to the house? Which stop. <laughs> Tran's crashing at his house. <laughs> it, it, just staying on his couch. He's got plenty of room. He's got that giant house. It's just him. He doesn't even have a dog. He just like rambles around there. Two pals bunking together. Yep. You know, old Two friends. Buds <laughs> hanging out. I bet you Tran has a Speedo at his house hanging up in his bathroom. <laughs> I bet you it's there right next to Marty. <laughs> At the hotel, Savage sees himself on the news. And then the PD come, the Miami PD come in full force. They come in because they got a they got a tip from Harriet, the woman behind the counter, that he was there. So he just Savage just calmly goes downstairs, murders her, and takes off. By the time the Miami PD come there, they find Harriet dead behind the counter and obviously no one else at the hotel essentially. Yeah. Poor clerk. Probably shouldn't have <laughs> left the lot for him <laughs> <laughs> so now we get some more information about jack and we've kind of like yada 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 over this espinosa thing because in the beginning castillo says he wants out and there's a couple of scenes here and there where they're talking to jack he's the head of security for espinosa but now we're going to go over to jack's hotel room and he's talking to savage he wants savage to just do his job but now there's problems he's causing headaches jack tells savage he's just a sick man he needs to stop killing these hookers and then savage threatens jack he grabs by the tie gets real close to his face and says we've worked yeah, together dude. a lot don't you ever say something and, like and that to me again goes, and, and then after that really awkward confrontation savage goes and lays down on the bed <laughs> and takes a nap yeah that was really they're, weird <laughs> they are also roomies which is really weird <laughs> that they're just hanging out in the hotel room in, uh, in the hotel together like he threatens him and then goes and takes a nap and Jack's like, well, I guess I better get back to eating my burger. <laughs> uh, Jack, by the way, played by Brad Sullivan, who was also in the movies Slapshot, The Untouchables, The Abyss, and a movie called Dead Bang with Don Johnson. I'm really intrigued by that last movie because I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about that movie either. That's And that's why I wanted to mention it because I didn't recognize it at all. I was like, oh, look, Brad was in a movie with Dawn after Vice. And I was like, dead bang. Like, <laughs> what the what hell? Hell? <laughs> Why does it sound like sort of, why does it sort of sound like a porn? What were they doing? Oh my god, was he in porn? <laughs> <laughs> we have a real fast scene out at Lawson's boat, the ex CIA, where he tells Castillo and Tran that Savage isn't CIA anymore. They got him killing hookers and the they company cut him. him loose. Like as of last week. Yeah, they know? fired him. <laughs> He's freelancing now. And well, they also- you know, they told him to stop killing hookers, wrote him up, suspended them, and he just kept killing hookers, so they had to fire him. <laughs> Union rules, you got to go through all the steps. <laughs> well, they also cut loose his handler, a man named Jack 
Coleman. Wonder where we heard that name before. Sounds so we head suspicious. back to Jack's hotel, and Castillo and Tran are having a very weird and relaxed conversation with Jack. Where Jack's like, yeah, I, I work with Savage. Yeah, he still kills people. He kills hookers sometimes, too. What's the problem? We can't control him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, Jack's staying at a noticeably nicer hotel, the Savage. So Savage is moving <laughs> yeah. on up now. So, but yeah, Coleman almost looks bored in the conversation. And then at the end, you can, I mean, possibly drunk well <laughs> it's like he has not a yeah, care in the world does not... he doesn't care which if castillo or tran were wearing a wire they would have had all the evidence they need to arrest jack but instead there's like jack's like hey yeah yeah he's gonna kill espinosa it's probably too late already too and uh yeah i'm not gonna say sorry you guys should have known this yeah it's on you <laughs> yeah which, which kind of sucks for espinosa miami pd has not even attempted to protect him up to this point <laughs> Uh, well, um, they don't protect many people. You have to be pretty special. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, so, but they really didn't protect this guy. And Savage is re- uh, uh, in the very next scene gets really stabby with him. <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of cranky. <laughs> Castillo asks about the hookers, and Jack says, Who cares? <laughs> Whatever happens. They're hookers. I just can't. I had a hard time paying attention to this scene because Jack kept calling Castillo Castillo. Yeah, Castello. <laughs> Castello. Like, what? <laughs> Tran says he doesn't seem to be that upset about Espinosa canceling his speech and the most VC were killed in their sleep. And Jack's like, eh. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> he sits back, <laughs> sips his cognac, chews on his cigar. Castillo gets up and tries to call Espinoza, but the line is dead. So he's like, hey, it's happening right now. We have to run off. So they head over to Espinoza's. And this is where we're going to be the second last scene of the episode. Out of Espinoza's, the dingus on security detail gets killed real fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even think he understood what he was supposed to be doing. He like, just goes right out to the door. do 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 Savage starts heading upstairs. Tran and Castillo are racing to the scene. At the precinct, the musketeers are off to race out to Espinosa's hotel. But Trudy stops Crockett and says, hey, that's not the real Tran. The real Tran was killed in the Tet Offensive in 1968. This is the real Tran. And that's when the real shock of like, oh, shit. Who is Castillo actually working with then? And how come he doesn't recognize the real Tran? Well, that's because he actually never met the real Tran. You remember... We opened up in Saigon in 72, whereas the real Tran died in 68 in the Tet Offensive. So the guy yeah. we met from the very beginning was never Tran. He just claimed to be. Yeah, he just lied about his name. And this is where I have to admit, I have a hard time figuring out which year is earlier than the other year. Because <laughs> at first I was like, okay, so Tran died like after he met. This one took his place. And then we started talking about the pre-show. I'm like, oh. Oh, 1968 is before 1972. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, while this is happening, Castillo is ninjaing off the roof at Espinosa's. <laughs> yes. Dude, and they really jaw it out too, man. They like really slow walk their way through this guy's place. And it is really slow to the point where I thought they were filming in slow motion. They're slowly moving throughout the house. Tran and Castillo kind of split up. And I'm starting to think now, okay, so Tran is crooked. Castillo's a dead man. Yeah, I think he's in trouble. Castillo turns a corner and Savage is hiding behind. Slow-mo does start and Savage stabs Castillo. Tran turns and shoots and kills Savage. Mysteriously, it didn't Which, look like when he shot him, the bullets hit him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tran is, is becoming more and more obvious is not an actual cop because it took a few a few misses before you finally hit him. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like It didn't look like it hit him at all. It fired <laughs> over the top of him. <laughs> Tran then goes over to Castillo and says, oh, you'll be all right. You're good. <laughs> he hears sirens he's be okay. <laughs> and he runs off. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, he's like bleeding. And he's yeah. like, yeah, you'll be kid. You're good. I'm going to sit around and wait. Sorry. I yeah. got to go. You're good. Uh, I-, I need to borrow this K-bar sticking out of you. <laughs> yeah. Snatch. <laughs> and then he immediately heads over to Jack's hotel and kills Jack with Savage's knife. No one ever deserved to die. Which I will tell that you, that was, <laughs> that was somewhat surprising, yet just yet I think justified. No one batted an eye at that one. Um, <laughs> The next scene is great because it starts off with Marty wearing short. Who wears short shorts? (laughs) Marty wears short shorts. 
Castillo, see, I see guy Castillo's out there stepping on hermit crabs, <laughs> feeding seagulls <laughs> and asses. <and stuff. laughs> Um, you don't know that he has a way with the seagulls, okay? They're his only friends. He lives by the water, you know. Castillo don't care. He's up there hanging brain. He don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and how come Crockett and Tubbs look so uncomfortable when they're on the beach? Because they're wearing like dress shoes, like they walking also along. walk up and they hand Castillo. They tell him they couldn't find Tran. He left a note though. And they hand it to Castillo, and Tubbs is straining really hard. He really wants to read that note. <laughs> he's like, like looking over his shoulder. He's, he's like, like I- so we don't get to know what it says. I mean, we walked can, it all can the I way please, out here. <laughs> can, can I please summarize what the note basically said? Yes. <laughs> I am not Tran. You don't need to know what my name actually is. But I am actually lieutenant in this army, this regiment. Just in case you were curious, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why I've been following and trying to catch this killer for all these years, but I hope we can still be friends. <laughs> Love some random guy. <laughs> not Tran. P.S. Thank you for letting me use your lotion. <laughs> Roomy. And that's the end of the episode. Hey, maybe they were his hookers from Saigon. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's what I thought. Maybe it was a disgruntled (laughs) pimp. He was pissed. We don't get any answers at the end of this episode. And it had a lot of twists and turns. And some more information we'd like to know about other people's relationships. (laughs) (laughs) What were they doing at night? I'm just kidding. (laughs) So he doesn't give his name in the letter, but he he does reveal that he was Viet Cong intelligence. We did learn a little bit about who Tran was, just not necessarily why he was following the murderers or trying to catch the murderer just yeah, that he was and, a spy yeah and i'm sure we have a lot of spook didn't notice <laughs> and i'm sure we have a lot of final thoughts on that too because this episode is really strong and sometimes vice has a hard time right at the very end so i think we'll save our our, our review of that until our final thoughts so let's go talk about this week's music all right john we actually have a really deep music segment three Really good bands, and one of them, a really big name, too. What do you got for us this week? So let me start off. We get Anything by the Damned. And if you remember, this is the Captain Sensible and Rat Scabies band we spoke about a little while back. I would love to talk more about a man named Rat Scabies, but he will return again this season, episode 22, in Viking Bikers from Hell. (laughs) <laughs> so I think Perfect. I'm going to wait and we're going to talk more about Captain Sensible and Rat Scabies then. <laughs> Perfect. So Perfect. Th- that brings us to Blood and Roses by the Smithereens. They were an American rock band from uh, uh, Carteret, New Jersey, formed in 1980. Uh, known for Basically, they were known for modest hits in the late 80s. This song was used on the soundtrack for the movie Dane Close as well. They actually got quite a bit of rotation on MTV at the time. But let's talk a little bit about the actual members of the band. So we have Pat D- Denizio on vocals, who was also in... The 1992 movie Singles, he also made a guest appearance on Space Ghost Coast to Coast 1996 and wrote a couple books, including Confessions of a Rockstar in 2009. Even more interesting, in the year 2000, he ran for the New Jersey seat on the U.S. Senate. He came in fourth in votes, but during the campaign, it was chronicled in a documentary called Mr. Smithering Goes to Washington. <laughs> I have a hard time imagining him run, running for office thinking he had a chance seeing their haircuts <laughs> that they had for their band in the music video I watched. The, also in the band, we have Jim Babjack who, on guitar. Babjack has contributed to movies such as... I, I mean, he's basically, other than being in the band, he com- he was a music composer for TV and movies as well. So he has contributed music, I, I guess sort of in the sense that Jan Hammer contributes, is a composer, that style. Babjack contributed music to movies Bull Durham, Backdraft, Encino Man, Time Cop, Romy and Michelle's High School Wedding, Boys Don't Cry, Golden Kumar, 
and the list goes on and on. So uh, dude oh, was that is, busy. That is a great list, except for Encino Man. Pauly Shore movies should disappear from the face of the earth forever. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you like how we threw that one in? Biodome, <laughs> son-in-law, you got no sense of humor. <laughs> Polly Shore movie should disappear from the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah, so, <not> funny. <laughs> so Bad Jack has also contributed to soap operas, Passions, and The Guiding Light. A myriad of late night shows, including SNL, Conan, Late Night with Jay Leno, The Arsenio Hall Show, and even The Dennis Miller Show. So, like, did not distribute good shows, bad shows. Dennis Miller, I'm looking at you. <laughs> when he was not performing he had a day job at a bank on top of contributing music to all those things he also worked a day job as a manager at a bank being a rock star pays decent uh, con- <laughs> being a composer pays not so well <laughs> we also have mike Mastaros on bass and he's a career musician dennis deacon on drums and dennis is a fill-in dj on WFMU in New Jersey. He was also in that episode of Space Ghost, and he's still rocking, playing the drums. We're gonna move on to our last band, and probably the biggest band of the episode, Jefferson Airplane, with their song White Rabbit. Formed in 1965 in San Francisco, they were kind of famous for that kind of hippie kind of sound. Played early with a lot of musicians like Jerry Garcia. The Jefferson Airplane started in 65 when Martin Bailey, an old pizza parlor on Fillmore Street, and turned it into a music Music club, and they began recruiting band members and lots of band members throughout their journey. There would be a total of 14 of them. Their biggest hits were the songs White Rabbit and Somebody to Love. Let's get a little bit. So, we're gonna work through a little bit of a history here. In November 65, they signed with RCA Victor, getting a then unheard of advance of $25,000. Later in 65, Grace Slick would replace Signe Anderson on vocals after Signe Anderson would leave after giving birth to her daughter in 66. And Grace Slick, dude, she was a rock star. Boy, was she a rock star. So first of all, Slick's uh, was actually in a band that was opening up for Jefferson Airplane at the time. Oh, The Great Society. And she actually wrote the song White Rabbit while she was in The Great Society. And then her brother-in-law, Lau Darby, helped her write Somebody to Love. I mean, their two biggest hits were written, and both were written while they were in the band, The Great Society. I also like that they got an advance of an unheard of $25,000. That sounds like just enough money to play, to play in the biggest heist of David Bowie equipment ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they actually recorded the song White Rabbit with the Great Society, produced by Sylvester Stewart, who would eventually become Sly Stone. Damn. So it reportedly wow. took 50 takes to achieve sa- his to live up to his satisfaction. Their biggest hit comes from this other band, produced by this hugely famous guy, and Slick bought out of her contract with the Great Society for $750. <laughs> Not much. Whoops. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. So after she was bought out of her contract, the Great Society broke up in late 66. As we continue on, in 68, their ego started to get big. They started to get into psychedelic rock. But, I mean, they were killing it the whole time. Every album that they released was in the uh, top 50. In 68 is when their ego started to get a little bit of the best of them. They went on the Smother Brothers Comedy Hour. And things got a little little heated uh, when Gray Slick appeared in blackface and gave the Black Panther salute after their performance. Wow. She said afterwards that she said afterwards that she just wanted to wear all the makeup in the dressing room. It wasn't intending on being in blackface, but yeah, come on, guys. Wow. So then, in 1969, while Slick was recovering from uh, throat surgery, several band members created the band Hot Tuna which will be important in a minute. Also, I love the name of a band, Hot Um, (laughs) So once Slick would cover, she would go on to the Dick Cavett show where they would drop the F-bomb. And actually, all throughout 69, the album they let go, which was full of F and MFers. (laughs) So they actually started to keep some of the contents for some of their content and some of the lyrics. At the same time, in 1970, uh, 
Hot Tuna actually started to become popular. Later in 70, Slick began a relationship with band member Paul Katner, and in 71, they had their daughter, China Wing Katner. This is when Marty Balin, who uh, uh, initially was the founders of the band, would start to step away from the band. He gets sober, he got really into yoga, <laughs> and, you know, and he, he wanted to go a different way musically. Grace Slick, she didn't slow down at all. Even though she just had a kid, in May of 71, she was injured in a near-fatal car crash while drag racing with fellow bandmate Kokonen through a tunnel near the Golden Gate Bridge at over 100 miles an hour, <laughs> where when oh she would God. spin out of control and slam into a wall. Wow. Things would continue to get heavier with escalating cocaine use and Slick's alcoholism starting to cause problems. Problems, and eventually in 72 they'd released their final album long john silver at that point the band would split and several of the band members would continue on in their band hot tuna which was actually doing kind of good at the time believe it or not a band called hot tuna was popular <laughs> <laughs> in the 70s but that would not stop at that point they would change their name to jefferson starship in 1973 rca terminated the band and salaries and basically their contract forcing one of the newer members to actually draw an employment so that he could make his house payment <laughs> so <laughs> jefferson starship would start promptly in uh, 1974 and they would rock on until the uh, 1985 and then eventually return in the 90s with Kantner led revival but during Starship they actually had several hits during that time from 74 to 85 their two biggest hits being fooled around and fell in love and we built this city obviously two very different ends of the spectrum and immediately i think of guardians of the galaxy 2 with fooled around and fell in love because that song is in it you know and it's all poppy and then as soon as i see we built this city the first thing i think of is the simpsons with homer on spring break <laughs> singing, we built this city for rock and roll so so, so i in This Week in Vice, I've talked about Starship and We Built This City. And I, I bagged on them pretty hard then. And you would think this would be my, my opportunity to say, because I'm going to have to mention them again, because they're going to have another n number one hit with Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now in 1987. You would think i say, you know, on This Week in Vice, I was probably a little hard on them, you know. But fuck those guys. <laughs> I really Tired don't like you. Starship. <laughs> I don't like Jefferson Starship. Jefferson Airplane is good. What they turned into is garbage. And I really, really hate Starship. So if you thought I was going to come back around and be like, I was probably a little hard on them. No, they suck. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Starship, the Katner led, still touring. So if you want to go see, the, see them, obviously. I'm going to go tell them he sucks in person. Want to. Go to a fair. Yes. They're at some fair, county fair, <laughs> carnival. They're there. By the way, Grace Slick. Just, she's a hero. I mean, God, she was so rock and roll. I mean, in <laughs> drag racing, in car crashes, and cocaine, and Jesus. <laughs> At least someone does something cool in the band that eventually becomes Starship <laughs> Lame Asses. Well, <laughs> see, well, music took a turd, but not from the person you were probably expecting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Melissa. This is a Castillo episode. Castillo. This is a Castillo, Castillo. episode. You are normally the biggest fan of Castillo. <laughs> what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I love this episode. And because of the no mustache and ponytail right out the gate, okay? <laughs> right out the gate, you know you're going to see something good. I, I love Castillo's character and i love anything that, that gives you a glimpse into like why he's the way he is he's like a mystery right he's in a, a mystery wrapped in an enigma wrapped, no, <laughs> he's he's a mystery like you don't know you don't understand his emotion if he has emotions if he's human or what he's gone through and i love that they give him a little bit more story and he's back to being his normal he's there but he's you know he, he actually cares about the people that are working <laughs> with him I, like, I mean and I, the, obviously they chose the right person to play tran an accomplished you know an academy award-winning actor you couldn't get better than that. So I like it. I don't like, I mean, obviously I don't like that he's killing hookers. <laughs> that disturbs me. <laughs> and that the government's letting him do it just because he's a murderer. Like it's, that's even worse. He's a double murderer. <laughs> so I like it. Uh, obviously it was 
lacking Swy Tech, and it's like it's going to be that way for a while. I think. I think because it's they're trying to figure out where he fits in here and there and stuff. And Trudy was kind of a snooty in this one. <laughs> she didn't want to put in all that work she put in, but she Trudy got it done. Solves the whole thing just from her desk. I know she doesn't even need them. They, why they? Yeah. Why don't they let her execute like the arrests or anything though? She does all the work. John, what are your final thoughts? So, like Melissa, I really like this episode. I mean, I really like this episode. I think it flowed well. I really did enjoy this episode. I think the the only thing that was that was sort of missing in the episode was at the end we really didn't know what Trans' motivation was when we found out he wasn't the inspector because we knew the inspector, you know, obviously trying to solve an old case, but without him being the inspector, we really don't know why he was so dead set on finding this guy. So, but that aside, it was a great episode and something was bugging me the whole episode like there's a, i really like this episode i can't figure out why what was it, what it is about the episode that was really making me that really uh, had me hooked and then i realized that, that i am a big cis fan they did a whole season where they were chasing the port to port killers called him and he was a cia assassin that had gotten out of the cia troll and had begun murdering people. Now, he wasn't murdering prostitutes like the Savage, but you could see where NCIS kind of kind of took some of this episode and used it as motivation for that what they were doing that season. And I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed it was as much as I did, because it was like I, I could recognize NCIS, you know, way in the future is paying homage to an episode of Miami Vice that they really liked uh, enough that they drew it out for a whole season a very similar character to the savage yeah and you know I'm agree with you guys is that I really did enjoy this episode and I knew I was going to enjoy it and so I saw the mustacheless <laughs> Castillo in the very beginning but through and through as with all Castillo episodes we are going to get a storyline like nothing else that the show has ever done before because that's reserved explicitly for Castillo episodes. It was going to be something really messed up and there's a chance in these where things are going to go really sideways, which is Castillo gets stabbed again. <laughs> again. <laughs> so, uh, spoiler alert, uh, this is the last time he will be stabbed though. <laughs> <laughs> he finally learned his lesson. <laughs> no more stabbings for Marty. He he's had enough of them. <laughs> but this is a really good episode i'm kind of disappointed at the very end we don't find out what tran is like what his real motivations were but overall the the episode really does a good job the storyline is really good we have some of our classic vice writers and directors that are on board for this so there's no coincidence that we were gonna like this episode being castillo centric and then being some of the season one and season two staff so uh i'm not surprised that we ended up really enjoying this episode and I will agree with that. It's kind of, we've kind of fallen into this trap where we don't have a lot of tubs. We don't have a lot of swy tech. So I, I, I want them to come back. That'd be cool. And we're going to get a Crockett personal story next week. And then following that, you will get a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful episode. It's all tubs. There's okay. no Crockett. All right. We're coming back then. It's an amazing episode. And yes. I mean that in the worst way possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Think Tubs trapped on an island, <laughs> and people are trying to kill him. <laughs> Perfect. T tell me, he has an accent. Is he stuck on Jamaica? <laughs> <laughs> He's. It's definitely. Yeah, I don't know. But they even gave him a love interest. T tell me, he's got. Oh, no, tell me he has to use like a French accent. Tell me it's somewhere like <laughs> Scottish. It's a Scottish yeah. accent. <laughs> Just to close out, like I really did like this episode and we're kind of bouncing back from Cuba Libre. I'm looking at you, although Starship worked its way into this episode. And that makes me angry. <laughs> me no liking that. <laughs> <laughs> But I really liked it. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you what your thoughts are on this episode. We don't get many Castillo-centric episodes. When they do, they're fantastic. So we want to know from you, how does this rank against other Castillo episodes? This one's really good. 
We're getting cut. We got kind of really far away from the last time we had one when he had to do the ninja stuff out on the island for his old CIA buddy. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought about this episode. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the other ways that you can contact us. You can also find show notes and all the ways to subscribe. Did you know you can catch this show on iTunes? Google Music, TuneIn, YouTube. You can pretty much find us anywhere podcasts are found. And you know what? Where you listen to those podcasts, give us a review. That would really help us. It would help us know what you like about the show. It would help us share the episode or this amazing podcast with other people. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to blow smoke at anyone. Give us a five-star review. Two thumbs up. Whatever the highest review is on your podcast platform of choice, just go ahead and give us a highest review no one reads the the actual review so don't write anything in it just write in the description of your review how much you love castillo and give us a five-star review that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pal fool around and fell in love